As if Chinese bats that brought us COVID-19 aren't bad enough, now they're a Danish mink carrying a mutation that has already infected people. Is the disease changing so rapidly it's impossible to keep up? This is Roundtable. And a warm welcome from me, David Foster. There are two parts to this programme, a potential problem with COVID-19 and a possible solution to the pandemic. Blanket testing has been carried out in Slovakia. More on that later, but first, mink and mutations. Danish health authorities raised the alarm over a mutant virus last week. The authorities had found genetic changes that they say might undermine the effectiveness of future COVID-19 vaccines. Now, more than 200 people have been infected with mink-related coronavirus. And at least six countries, including Denmark, but also Spain, Sweden, Italy, the Netherlands and the US have reported outbreaks of coronavirus in mink farms. Denmark has announced a cull of all 17 million mink. But even if that is successful in stopping the danger, how much of a problem could virus mutations be? Well, we can now begin the discussion. I'm very pleased to say that we can welcome to Roundtable from Bath in the UK, Dr. Bharat Pankania from the University of Exeter Medical School. We cross to the west coast of the United States and welcome Dr. Amory Kimball, epidemiologist who also works with the Centre on Global Health Security at Chatham House and with us also from Wageningen in the Netherlands, Wim van der Poel, Dutch vet who's an expert on zoonotic diseases, they being the ones that spread from animals to humans. I'm going to come to you last of all um, about zoonotic diseases, Wim, but first of all, let me address this question to both Barat and Amri. Amri, you, you first. We've heard the supposed good news about a possible vaccine uh, for COVID, uh, Pfizer, the company that is supposed to be making it, and I'm sure everybody welcomes that, but if it works, would it work in a mutation such as the one we're seeing in Dutch mink? Amory? I think that's absolutely the central question. What we know from the human cases in the Netherlands is that there seems to be some suppression of antibody production. The question is, with your new mRNA platform and the antibody production that seems so satisfactory in the Pfizer vaccine, is it going to make a difference? And I think that jury is still pretty much out. There's some evidence, obviously alarming enough, that you're seeing major culling of mink in the Netherlands and moving up the ban on mink farming. So clearly, I mean, I'm not privy to all the evidence, but I think that is the concern. It's too early. You're to right say. to mention the Netherlands, but it's primarily in Denmark, I think, where the, the mink yes. have been affected. But it has been found in the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Italy, uh, the United States. So. My question then is, and Barrett, I'll come to you in just a moment. My question then is, if it might not work because of the mutation, every time we see a mutation, are we going to have to find a different vaccine? Uh, the answer to that is probably not, because this virus has been actually mutating throughout its transmission. And that mutation uh, process is being tracked. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the sequences are being published and people are looking at that as we go along. So I don't think that's going to be the case at all. And I think, as I said, the jury is still out whether this particular mutation, which is being controlled, uh, this particular strain, whether that in fact would have an impact on the vaccine. And your thoughts, Barrett? So um, the other thing is the science of are you immune? And we measure, the only thing that we can measure is antibody levels. So there may be uh, effective immune response. It's just that we are unable to measure it properly. So that's also another item to have in the equation about does this virus produce immunity? Uh, only time will tell because on the one hand, we may not be able to measure immune antibodies, but that doesn't mean the person is not immune to it. Tell me about this particular uh, coronavirus in mink. Uh, it has been passed to humans. Is it as dangerous to them in that case when they're infected as the common COVID-19 that we've been seeing or not? 
Well, we don't know is the honest answer because uh, it is a zoonotic that is now transferring from uh, mink to humans. Uh, it may cause the same level of illness or it may cause a severe form of the illness. That we don't know. But thinking empirically, I don't expect it to be significantly different from the standard SARS-CoV-2 infections that is uh, obtained from human-to-human -human transmission. Nevertheless, I'm very concerned, and our, our colleague on zoonosis will tell us, that we don't want this virus to become endemic in the animal population. Because if it does, it will be very difficult to control it in the human population going forward. Your cue, Wim, what do you reckon? Yes, I agree with the former speakers. Um, we uh, saw, uh, well, as my Danish colleagues, they saw a strain appearing in mink that uh, showed a mutation in the spike protein. This is an immunodominant protein, so this protein may be involved uh, in uh, antibody development and uh, also in the vaccine response to uh, in, uh, in in patients. But um, the next question is, uh, how dangerous is this mutation? Our Danish colleagues have seen that um, uh, the antibodies developed against the uh, in human circulating strains seem to be less protective towards this mink strain. But they have done very few uh, experiments. So there is more research needed to show whether this virus is more aggressive in people, uh, let's say causing more disease, or uh, spreads rapid, more rapidly in the human population. So there is uh, a, lot of, a lot more research to do to show whether this mutant is really dangerous. And there was Barrett uh, wondering whether this could become endemic in the animal population, by which I think he was suggesting that it could spread from mink to, to other animals, whether they be farmyard, uh, captive animals, wild animals, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Is that a possibility? I think that's a very good question and a very important question. Uh, also in mink, we don't want a reservoir of this SARS coronavirus. If we have a decreasing number of infections in people, and we maintain a reservoir in, in mink farms, that will still be a problem because all the time there will be a risk that the mink virus is transmitted to people again. So we don't want a reservoir in mink farms, but we also don't want a, a reservoir in other animals. So it's also important to look into other man animals to see whether the virus spreads to other wildlife, for example. And also there is the possibility of spreading to other livestock. So it's important to do research in these other animals to see whether the virus is circulating there and whether it may develop a, a reservoir. I, I'm wondering whether the, the culling of the mink, up to 20 million of them, and the concerns about this mutation would have even surfaced had we not had a global pandemic. In other words, do these sort of things happen naturally all the time and we don't normally notice them? Species jumps happen all the time. So if viruses are not so pathogenic, we, we, may, not, we may not see it. But uh, in this case, the virus is very pathogenic. And so it's very important to see uh, whether this virus spreads in the, in the mink population. Barad, let me come to you first of all. I was reading in the Financial Times just a few days ago about another mutation, one that started in Spanish farm workers. It's now said to be um, responsible for 80% of the new infections in the UK. How many mutations are we going to see? And, and if we can't control them, can we control the, the disease at all? Oh, I'd be quite relaxed about it. You have to look at it like this as a tree with many, many branches. It is still a tree. And as long as it is many branches belonging to the one tree and it continues to express the what we call the spike proteins against which we are making immunity and uh, uh, antibodies too, um, we will be able to tackle it. Furthermore, um, if there is a big change in the spike protein, it may be a very good change, for example, meaning the spike protein can now no longer 
attached to human receptors and therefore infect and cause infection and disease in humans. So it is a normal course, it's a natural history of these RNA viruses whereby they make mistakes in replication. And the good news is most of these mistakes are in our favor. So that's, that's the way to look at it. And we will get what we would call a predominant strain. So that would be the main yeah. branch of a tree that becomes the And that's, the, that's the one that strain. we are, that's the one that we're mostly having to deal with. Amory, mm. I know you are concerned about mutations, but the general sense I'm getting is that they are inevitable. There's not very much we can do about them. We just need to keep our eyes open for the ones that are particularly nasty. Yes, I think the best analogy would be bird flu, you know, H5N1, when it emerged in Southeast Asia. We saw widespread culling of poultry, and that was to reduce the threat of mutation of a very pathogenic virus. It was not nearly as transmissible to humans as this virus is, but it had a high mortality rate. And so you saw the same, the same approach, which was basically extensive culling of poultry to uh, reduce your reservoir. I completely agree. These RNA viruses, they will continue to mutate. And I also agree that as they mutate and as they transmit, they usually become more infectious, but they very rarely become more lethal than what they had been previously. They generally attenuate. And that's the good news. So I would go along with the other speakers on that. If we don't live in such proximity to animals, if we don't eat the wrong animals, et cetera, et cetera, if we don't farm minks, this would prevent zoonotic diseases spreading, would it not? Yes, I agree that contacts with animals, uh, changing contacts with animals, uh, changing uh, livestock management will change our contacts with animals and that, will, that may increase zoonotic infections. So especially when you uh, keep animals uh, together with other animals, uh, which normally wouldn't meet in, 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 in nature, you may uh, uh, induce, uh, increase the risk of species jumps. So uh, it's very important to really look into the way we are dealing or hold, uh, keeping animals. And yes. what about the, the irony in the fact that most of the mink that are farmed in Denmark end up in China? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, most of the mink uh, is exported to China. On the other hand, there is also a lot of fur production in China. Uh, not only mink, but also raccoon dogs. And raccoon dogs may also be susceptible to SARS coronavirus too. So I think it's very important to keep uh, screening or uh, monitoring uh, animals like raccoon dogs and uh, also minks to see whether there are introductions of SARS coronavirus. I know there's so much more to say. I'm going to have to draw a line under it. But listen, thank you very much indeed, uh, Barat, Amory and Wim. Thank you very much indeed for your expertise and your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, now we turn to the issue of mass testing in Slovakia and in the UK city of Liverpool. People have been tested at pretty much the same time and countries across the world are watching closely. Mass testing for coronavirus is underway in Slovakia and the city of Liverpool in the UK as a way of battling the virus. According to Slovakia's Prime Minister Igor Matovic, 3.6 million people, that is two thirds of the population, took part. A UK government team went to Slovakia to witness the testing, keen to learn lessons before a mass testing which was launched in Liverpool. Everyone living or working in the cities now offered regular COVID-19 tests with rapid turnaround tests available. Some health experts argue that testing, as they put it, could do more harm than good by wasting government's health resources. Other countries are watching the results. So does mass testing work? And could it be a key weapon in the fight against coronavirus? Now, at this point in the programme, we can welcome from Liverpool in the UK, Louise Kenny, Pro Vice-Chancellor of the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences at the University of Liverpool. Then we head to Slovakia. In Bratislava, we find Lubomir Rehak, who's the Slovakian ambassador to the United Kingdom, just happens to be out of the country on business at the moment. And also in Bratislava, Richard Kohler, associate professor of mathematics 
at Comenius University. Uh, Louise, I'll come to you in a little while after we talk about what's happened in Slovakia. Uh, Lubomir, I know you've been tested and you've been found to be negative, that is, since your arrival in the country, but the mass testing, what was the point of it? Uh, government of Slovakia opted for this as an alternative and uh, complementary measure to another strict lockdown. Because our measures uh, in spring were successful, Slovakia, with its five, five and a half million inhabitants, uh, had only uh, some 4,000 cases and only uh, 33 casualties uh, uh, by the end of August. It was possible thanks to a rapid lockdown decision and a discipline also of our population. Uh, at the same time, our foreign ministry was coordinating repatriation of Slovaks at times from abroad uh, who were trapped uh, abroad and my embassy uh, helped to over 1,400 uh, citizens there. So but with the since... mass testing that has just happened, yeah. uh, if we could come to the present day, uh, Mr. Ambassador, what was the purpose of that and have you had any results back? Yes, since October, numbers of infected uh, persons uh, in Slovakia rose uh, dramatically. So government uh, decided to uh, to make a state uh, of emergency again. And uh, as a circuit uh, breaker measure, they opted for this mass screening uh, by uh, testing. Uh, for being su successful and effective uh, alternative to full lockdown, uh, mass testing uh, should have been rapid. Uh, it means uh, to use antigen uh, rapid tests taking just some uh, 15 to 30 minutes to have a result. It should be non-invasive, so no blood tests, uh, just a, a nasal swab, uh, and uh, should have been relatively uh, cheap. Uh, that's why the most uh, uh, reliable PCR tests uh, are expensive, uh, and uh, we opted for, for this uh, antigen so let's, uh, test. Yeah. Let's bring Richard in at this point. Uh, Slovakian university academic, and you say this is all a waste of time. Not necessary, partially. So antigen tests are a really great tool to some way mitigate the situation in the most affected regions. And uh, that's why actually testing in the pilot project and also in the second, in the first and second round of the mass testing was very, very useful and really reduced seriously the level of infection in the regions. On the other hand, in the regions where the prevalence and you know recent incidence is very low, uh, maybe the other measures may be more efficient. I read here that you said this mass testing is a waste of resources. So perhaps it discovers something, but you don't think it discovers it in an effective way. No, no, not necessary. Again, this is some way taken out of context because in some parts of the country, actually the mass testing seems to be like a really, really efficient measure. And I recommend to use it in other countries and probably we will see it more often in different places around Europe and the world. On the other hand, again, in the low prevalence regions where we cannot find enough infected people, uh, it is a waste of resources because uh, the demand of the real rapid testing on the mass scale really uses all the local resources which are available and repeated testing is not uh, actually probably a very wise idea. OK, sorry if I got it slightly wrong in, in that, but thank you for your analysis. So what would you say uh, to Louise in Liverpool, who are going through the same procedure? Um, having been out, I think um, a lot of people from Liverpool and um, the government went out to Slovakia to see what you were doing there. What would you say to her? To test a, a local area like Liverpool's you know, city area or you know, area of the city, it's a very, again, a very useful uh, tool and it may reduce the a number of infected people in the, in the area seriously. So actually outsourcing uh, the resources from the outside of Liverpool may be a great, great idea and focusing them on the biggest problem of the epidemic problem in the UK. And uh, this may work in not only in the UK, but also in the other places. So on the other hand, again, the limitations of the tests and also the resources needed uh, say that, you know, using it in, I don't know, uh, I don't know what is the least effective part of the UK. But maybe over there, it wouldn't be so uh, so wise to use it now. Um, just Louise, think. to you now. Yeah. If, if I may come back to you, Mr. Ambassador, in yeah. just a moment. Okay. But I want to bring Louise in. She's been very patient. Um, the test is still underway or, or finished? Or and what, have, what so far have you learned, if anything? So we launched uh, mass asymptomatic serial testing in Liverpool last Friday. Um, and we've run it uh, through the weekend uh, yesterday and today. And we plan to actually run it for an indefinite period of time, certainly for several uh, more weeks at least. 
And the reason why we welcomed it in the Liverpool City region is because um, Liverpool was one of the worst affected parts of the UK in the second wave. Um, until very recently, the number of cases in Liverpool exceeded 500,000, 500 per 100,000. And in some areas of the city, the number of cases was over 700 per 100,000, which is extremely high. Um, Liverpool has um, a big socioeconomic divide and significant unmet medical need as it is. Our hospitals were filling at a really concerning rate and we were running out of bed capacity. So we were. And what is this chance... going to show you, though? Well, the, the idea behind this proposal is it's a, Liverpool are piloting this for the rest of the UK. Um, and what we are hoping to demonstrate um, is that we are able to pick up uh, people in the community who are infectious and who are uh, passing the virus um, and driving community spread, but are currently asymptomatic. Now, it, it's an issue because many of the tests that we've been using so far uh, are diagnostic tests. They're tests that the, where the performance of the test has been researched and validated in people who are symptomatic of the disease. Um, and we're using a test for um, a, a community where people are presenting for testing who are asymptomatic. But as um, one of your other guests has pointed out, in a city where community infection rates are exceedingly high, then there may be some, um, some proven benefit to doing that. What the university are bringing to it is the ability to independently analyse the data and publish it um, in, in short order. And that will hopefully... I'll come back to you, if I may, Louise, in a, in a little while and ask you what you've been able to learn so far um, mm -hmm. from analysing the data. But uh, Mr Ambassador, um, Lubomir, you, you wanted to say something. Yes, I wanted to add what Mr. Collar said that during the first uh, weekend of mass testing, over three and uh, uh, three point six million Slovaks uh, were tested, and approximately one percent of them were COVID positive. And due to lower uh, sensibility of these tests, uh, those positives uh, had. Uh, uh, a big concentration of COVID inside themselves. So they are also the most dangerous uh, for uh, spreading the, uh, the virus. It was uh, good to have a, a picture uh, of how, uh, how is it developed, uh, the diseases in, in the country. And uh, regarding uh, spendings, yes, in second round, there were only uh, roughly half of territory uh, of Slovakia tested, where in previous testing, uh, uh, positive test uh, cases were over uh, 0.7%. Uh, uh, and in fact, comparison of data in these uh, 45 uh, uh, districts of Slovakia show in the second round uh, a 58% decrease of, uh, of revealed infections, which is a very encouraging trend. Uh, Richard, do you think it'd be a good idea, rather than do it in massive population centres, uh, to, to roll it out into, into more localised testing sites? Oh, absolutely. The antigen tests may, uh, may be used, especially in small areas. You may you know, focus on a small village, you may focus on a city, you may focus on even you know, uh, some smaller parts of the city. So uh, these are probably the most efficient ways how you can use this test and also you need to use it frequently. So one test, usually one test, one round of testing probably doesn't bring as much uh, profit as if you do it repeatedly a couple of times, uh, particularly if you are able to do it twice a week. Mathematical uh, results in theoretical mathematics show that actually repeated testing with the frequency twice a week is probably the most efficient way. Okay. Uh, on, okay. the, yeah, on the other hand, actually, if you uh, extend the period between the testing, um, nobody knows how much does it work. And in Slovakia, we saw some reduction, but uh, one unknown factor, which is part of it, is the overall improvement of the, of the situation in Slovakia. And uh, probably we see a mutual I have to go to Louise now. I'm yeah. sorry, about, sorry about that, but time is our enemy. I have to go to Louise now and say repeat testing. Is that something that Liverpool could do? I know it's only a pilot project at the moment, but, you know, on and on and on and on. So it is our intention to perform testing uh, twice in a 10-day period. And then after the acute sweep through the city, we intend to maintain this past the uh, acute surge. Um, so in terms of what we've learned so far, um, the test is very acceptable. Um, it's a lateral flow device. It's self-administered. Um, it's very easy. We've not had um, any feedback from any of the well over 25,000 participants so far uh, who've had any difficulty using the test. Um, we are conducting a, 
uh, quality control measure. So we are performing PCR uh, on those who test positive for the first few days. I don't have that data yet because obviously PCR takes a little longer to report back. Um, but in the first few days, we identified 154 people in our community who tested positive on lateral flow, uh, who uh, are almost, uh, given the performance of the test, very hi highly likely to, to have COVID yeah. and to be infectious. And that's quite Briefly, important. Briefly, if you would, like and do you think this is the sort of thing that the UK as a whole would benefit from, that it should be rolled out nationally from what you've learned so far? I think in cities like Liverpool, where we have a particular issue, uh, where there is very high community transmission with a case prevalence at one point, you know, over 500 cases per 100,000 of the population, then MAST has a, has a role to play. I think it's also very uh, helpful in very specific uh, communities within the city, for example, um, student populations and also the care home sector, where we are keen to make sure that we can open up care homes again. Fantastic. Uh, great to hear from all three of you. Much appreciated your time on, on this programme and the work that you are all doing. And thank you wherever you are watching this edition of Roundtable. That is all we have time for. Until next time then, from me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team. Goodbye. <laughs>